Welcome, and thank you for joining today's Mushroom Council Nutrition Summit. I'm Christy Mather with Curious Plot, the Mushroom Council's Marketing Communications Agency. My role today is to help keep the webinar technology flowing smoothly, including driving the slides. A little bit about what to expect today. For those of you that are attending from the industry, the first hour features the Mushroom Council's expert nutrition advisors and a view of the nutrition landscape and research that the Mushroom Council has invested in on behalf of the industry. Council.org. Following the first hour, we have a question and answer session. Please use the Q&A feature here on Zoom to share your questions, and you're welcome to ask questions at any time during today's webinar. As they come, you go ahead and type those in. If we don't get to your questions by the time we conclude today, we're happy to follow up with you directly afterward. And with that housekeeping update, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Amy Wood. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Amy Wood, and I am the new president of the Mushroom Council. I'm happy to see that we have a very strong industry turnout today for uh, our Nutrition Research Summit. The Council has aimed to host a research summit once every five years in order to reflect on the prior years of investments and our results, to take stock of the current nutrition landscape, and then to set priorities for the years ahead. Today, we'll start with that overview of the past and share the general components of our research program. And then we will hear updates on three recent nutrition studies from the researchers themselves. We'll also hear from our panel of experts about future opportunities for mushroom research. And we'll close with enough time for questions from those of you who are from the industry in our, in our audience today. Over the past two decades, the mushroom industry has funded more than 50 nutrition studies and invested in approximately $6 million um, into that research. Here's a look back at the topics and priorities from years past. If you could advance the slide for us, Christy. We've been fortunate to have Mary Jo Feeney managing this program since its inception. Mary Jo received her Master of Nutrition from Case Western Reserve University and is an active member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and a member of the American Society for Nutrition. Um, I'd love to turn it over to Mary Jo to now um, kind of walk us through the next section of introducing our expert uh, panelists and researchers today. Okay. Thank you, uh, Amy, and welcome everyone. We can have the next slide that will show the uh, invited guests and our uh, research advisory panel. We've engaged these experts to help us evaluate and plan going forward. So the research advisory panel has guided the program uh, since its very beginning. And some of these uh, people uh, have been there from the very beginning, but our current members include Dr. Clemens from the USC Mann School of Pharmacy. He has expertise in food and drug toxicology. Dr. Ditchen, a senior uh, director of food science and technology at DSM Ferment. Dr. Dwyer, a senior scientist at the USDA John Maillet Human Nutrition Research Center on aging at Tufts. And she also serves as a contract to the Office of Dietary Supplements at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Walk is chief innovation officer who directs a multinational team of researchers charged with maintaining his company Sylvan Inc's position as a premier supplier of mushroom spawn and related process. Now our invited experts uh, represent the uh, results of the studies that you identified as priorities during the 2019 mini summit. Dr. Phillips from Virginia Tech is a senior research scientist who coordinated the bioactive analysis for inclusion in the USDA's uh, Food Data Central database. Dr. Campbell from Purdue University is conducting the largest clinical trials that have ever been funded by the Mushroom Council, investigating the effects of mushrooms on measures of cardiometabolic health, inflammation, immunity, and brain health. Dr. Hale is a research psychologist at the USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts. She and Dr. Claire Williams 
who is at the University of Reading in UK, are investigating the effects of mushroom, or, uh, mushroom oyster mushrooms uh, on cognitive, neurological, and metabolic effects in older adults. Leslie Bonsi is the owner of Active Eating Advice by Leslie, a nutrition consulting company. She specializes in nutrition communications. So we're looking forward to hearing the insight from all of these experts as we uh, move forward in our webinar. However, let's go to the next slide so we can uh, all take a look at how do we evaluate the uh, research advisory count of uh, the, the nutrition research program that we have. Successful nutrition research programs have several components. First of all, uh, they have uh, studies that take a look at the composition of the food to analyze nutrients in bioactives. Secondly, they have a wide variety and a strong, robust portfolio of both preclinical and clinical studies that will examine the benefits of consumption of those uh, nutrients and bioactives on human health. And thirdly, there is a strong component of communication to uh, communicate these results, not only to the research community, because we hoped that this will uh, uh, and, uh, encourage further additional research on uh, on these particular topics, but they also communicated to the health professionals to help them communicate with um, consumers and thus help improve their uh, general well-being. Now, another component of a successful research program is the guidance through a research advisory panel. This helps in, uh, maintain the scientific integrity of the program, which is extremely important as, as industry-funded uh, studies come under scrutiny. So now let's move forward to the next slide and take a look at the results of some of the uh, studies that were funded during the 2019 Mini Summit. And you will see that these studies represent the components of successful research programs in that we are hearing first from Dr. Phillips uh, from Virginia Tech on the analysis of the bioactives for inclusion in Food Data Central. Then we'll hear from Dr. Campbell on the uh, results of the consumption of mushrooms in health promotion. And then from Dr. Hale, who will tell us about the results of their study looking at the consumption on cognition. Now, we in the pro and because we are so limited on time, uh, I hope my colleagues recognize that you know you have ten minutes to present your uh, to talk about your slide, and um, I will ha have to help you move along so we can keep on uh, on our on our timetable. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Phillips, who will begin the discussion on the bioactive ergothionine. Dr. Phillips, over to you. Dr. Phillips, are you there? Hello. Hmm, looks like Dr. Phillips' mic is on, but we're not hearing anything. Okay. Oh, there she's connect. Now I see she's connecting to audio. Good. There we go. <clears throat> Can you hear us, Dr. Phillips? Let's proceed to the second uh, research, okay. and then we can come back to Dr. Phillips. Okay. Let's advance, um, Christy, to Dr. Uh, Campbell. Can you and... Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you the work that my research group's been doing over the last five years or so. Uh, really, uh, um, we when we set out to uh, work with the Mushroom Council, uh, uh, on your behalf, uh, we uh, mapped out uh, a, a series of experiments, uh, one that first and foremost uh, talked about metabolomic profiling, 
of mushrooms. Uh, basically, what compounds are in a mushroom beyond those that are uh, traditional nutrients, uh, minerals and vitamins and amino acids and the like. Uh, and then we also wanted to find that do a, the first a completely dietary controlled um, investigation of how mushrooms uh, may influence the healthfulness of a, a already healthy diet that's recommended by uh, organizations like the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And we specifically chose to do a Mediterranean style dietary pattern. So my one slide here, if you look over toward the left, you'll see that um, we uh, did a, uh, a, a, a untargeted metabolomics assessment of seven different types of mushrooms, white button, cremini, portobello, lion's mane, mataki, oyster, and shiitake. And you can see from that that um, when we, when you add up all the different compounds that were in these mushrooms, there were over 10,000 different compounds. And most of them, about two thirds of them or more, did not have a chemical name to go along with it. They were peaks on, a, on a, uh, uh, an analysis uh, uh, profile. But what we did de uh, detect is that there was a, a commonality of, uh, and you'll see here detected in all seven, 1,344 compounds. And of those, 61% did not have a name. 39% did have a, a, a annotated uh, identification. And then when we looked at further into each individual uh, variety of mushroom, you can see the names, uh, the, the, that total compounds, you can see how many of them were unique to only that mushroom. So for example, for white button, there were 62 compounds that, mush that that variety of mushroom had that the other six did not have. And you go up to lion's mane, where there were 854 compounds that the, the, uh, that variety of mushroom had. And 70% of those, you, I mean, look at the un, not annotated. The vast majority of compounds in all of these mushrooms uh, don't, have not been identified as either being in another type of food or that the chemical structure has been named. Uh, and so it just really, uh, one of the favorite things I have when I give talks on uh, mushrooms is to just ask people, well, when you eat a mushroom, how many compounds do you think you are eating? And I usually get names, numbers of 30 or 40 up to maybe a couple of hundred, but everybody sort of proverbially jaw drops when I tell them that there's over 10,000. Uh, so we're following this research up and it's still ongoing by actually taking white button mushrooms and oyster mushrooms and feeding them as part of a meal to uh, participants in an experiment and uh, looking for the presence of these compounds in their blood and in their urine. Uh, and now the, the clinical phase of that study is, uh, is done and the analytical phase uh, and the data processing phase of that is um, actively going on right now. So the second part of our, my, our uh, project uh, with the Mushroom Council was to do the first fully con dietary controlled uh, uh, study uh, looking at how including or not including one serving per day of 80, so three ounces, 84 grams of whole fresh mushrooms so, um, have on the uh, changes that people experience in their uh, cardiometabolic uh, disease uh, risks, as well as their brain and health and cognition, cognitive function when they consume 
uh, uh, these mushrooms versus a placebo, we happen to give them about a teaspoon of uh, breadcrumbs because uh, we 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 did not tell them what was in the mush in the breadcrumbs. Obviously, it's just uh, uh, you know bread. But uh, many of the volunteers thought we might have been giving them dried mushrooms in it. So uh, it was a, it was an effective placebo. And what we found is that when you start consuming a healthy Mediterranean style diet, you improve your many indications of, of both uh, cardiometabolic disease risks and uh, your brain health and cognition. In the case of uh, the cognitive uh, changes, there were improvements in their lipid profiles, there were changes in their blood pressure, there were changes in their glucose and, and, and other indicators of their uh, um, cardiometabolic health profile. The one that stood out for us was that adding the, including the mushrooms as part of the healthy dietary pattern helped lower their blood glucose more than if they uh, ate the, the control. And so that is one place where there is research from other studies uh, that are that support uh, a potential um, sort of uh, improvement in glucose control when you include mushrooms as part of someone's diet. Uh, but this is the first time where the, all other aspects of a diet were con uh, uh, controlled, and we also showed that a response. What we concluded, and I'll turn my head to read it, uh, or to read it uh, um, we concluded that adopting a healthy Mediterranean-style dietary pattern with or without consuming white button and oyster mushrooms um, is, uh, uh, is, is a positive influence on many established and emerging cardiometabolic disease risk factors among middle-aged and older adults um, who are still have clinically normal glucose control, but uh, so so the effects that we're seeing are would be considered subclinical, but they are nonetheless very much going in the right direction for to uh, lower people's risk for de eventually developing diabetes. When we look at the cognitive work, and I know other, uh, uh, we will hear much more about this. From the same study, we did a series of questionnaire-based uh, uh, assessments of uh, uh, depression and mood and well-being and behavioral tests, anxiety. And what we found is that mushrooms in and of themselves did not have any differential effects, but they also did not negate um, changes that were uh, taking place by adopting a healthy diet. And in particular, we were very interested that um, consuming the Mediterranean diet with or without the mushrooms improved hurt people's perceptions of vigor and activity and their perceptions that they were mentally sharp or have immediate memory. Um, and, and again, in these people that were middle-aged and older and at risk for being developing cardiometabolic uh, morbidities later in life, but were still apparently healthy. So I'll stop there, but I, I and I'll be glad to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Uh, we are, but we this research is still ongoing. And we are complementing the clinical work that I just described by also putting out a series of uh, system of uh, review articles on these topics. And you see at the top part of our my slide the assessment of mushroom consumption on cardiometabolic disease. We've done a, a systematic review of literature uh, to, and published it uh, to try to get a grasp of all of the research in this area as of last year. And we're doing a, a similar narrative review on immune function and, and inflammatory, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory properties of mushrooms as well.
Thank so you. I'll stop that and thank you. I think that um, if any questions that uh, anybody has, we are taking questions at the end. So we have Dr. Phillips, I believe, back uh, with us. So um, we'll turn it over. Uh, we're going to, I guess, go back one slide and take a look at the bioactive analysis uh, that Dr. Phillips has uh, uh, coordinated over the past couple of years. Dr. Phillips, are you with us? Um, yes, I am. I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, as Mary Jo said in the beginning, um, our purpose was to populate the USDA Foundation Foods database with um, data on nutrients and including bioactives in mushrooms. And this enhances the data in the Food Data Central by providing more of an estimate of variability since we sampled um, at least eight samples of each mushroom type from different producers um, compared to the SR legacy database where data were based on composites, which could obfuscate any sample to sample differences. Um, so what we had was eight samples per type, but six for the agaricus and enoki. And then we analyzed these for ergothionine and glutathione and we did find clear, well, not like clear, on average, we found higher contents in the three types, Piopini, Enoki, and Oyster. And then two of those were also the highest in glutathione, which we'll see on the next slide. But we, and we again found that the agaricus were across the board much lower than others. And then we had several in the intermediate levels. And I think the most important thing we found here was the variability sample to sample, as you can see by these error bars, which show the range. So the high is the maximum and the bottom of that is the minimum. So what this tells me is that there are factors that affect the content that a person using the average value in the database might really have a very different perception of what's in their sample that they're consuming compared to what that average value is. And a lot of people do use these average values. So one of the things we're doing with Foundation Foods is we want to communicate to the researchers and consumers of nutrition data, you know, what kind of bias there might be in these means so they can take that into account in their studies. And this actually doesn't contradict. There was Earlier studies, I think funded by the Mushroom Council, um, published maybe seven years ago by Beelman, Kolaris et al., um, they found a similar trend, but they analyzed a lot fewer samples. So they did not see necessarily the same divisions among types. So I guess let's look at the next slide where we did the glutathione. And in this, you know, it's the same, very same samples. And what we found here was a similar trend. However, the highest, one of the samples highest in glutathione was also one of the lowest. The mitaki was also lowest in ergothionine. And that does contradict what was published previously, where the mitaki was found to be highest in ergothionine. So again, we had more samples that went across more producers, so we possibly captured you know, a better average value. So again, we saw this very wide range among samples. They went into sort of general groups based on the average, but we need to consider you know, factors that affect the glutathione content if any claims are gonna be made or about a particular product, I would say. And we did do a little preliminary work looking at processing effect, like on the glutathione, in particular, freeze drying. And we found on a few samples, this was just sort of an exploratory study, we compared the freeze dried sample to the very same not freeze dried sample. And we found that the freeze drying gave us higher values. So it might be an issue of bioavailability or some other kind of change. And a lot of literature values are based on freeze-dried samples. 
So there's a lot of factors going into these contents that I think that's the biggest takeaway from our research is that we need to um, have a you know, better understanding of what's in particular products and not just use, you know, they need to be analyzed and not just use general values or assumptions about a particular type of mushroom. Thank you. Um, we'll now go to the uh, advance to Dr. Hale's slides. And uh, Dr. Hale will be reporting both for herself and Dr. Williams, who is at the University of Reading, but the time difference made it not possible for her to join. So uh, Dr. Hale, here, it's up. It's open to you. Go for it. Thank you, Mary Jo. So thanks for having me here today to present our results. I'm going to start in the top left. So we had done a systematic review, um, which is published in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews um, this year um, on the effects of mushrooms on mood and cog neurocognitive health across a lifespan. This is in humans. And what we did was we looked at um, 20 to make the systematic review, they had to meet certain criteria and 24 epidemiological studies made the review and 10 clinical studies that investigated the role of mushrooms on neurocognition and mood. Um, overall, um, in the epidemi epidemiological studies, um, it, they basically showed uh, a significant benefit of dietary patterns that included mushrooms of any species up to two portions per week on cognition and mood in both healthy and cognitively compromised populations, um, such as older people or mild cognitive impairment, things like that. Um, particularly, they decreased um, depressive mood symptoms and increased cognitive scores. The 10 intervention studies had more mixed results. Most were done with the lion's mane mushroom and most were done um, in Asian populations. Um, so these intervention trials had mixed results, um, mixed results meaning um, some showed improvements in certain aspects and others in others, um, but they weren't very well controlled. So it prompted the need for further acute and chronic human intervention studies using adequate sample sizes, employing appropriate sensitive neurocognitive tests, because if you have tests that are too easy, everyone does well, and then you don't see an effect of the intervention. And also to investigate a range of common mushrooms. So like I said, these were mostly, and also different populations, because these were mostly in an Asian population using the lion's mane. So unfortunately in this, um, a lot of the epidemiological studies looked at dietary patterns and not the effect of mushrooms separately. So that was another um, thing that came up um, that most also didn't catalyze, catalog, catalog what type of mushrooms were eaten. Also from this review, um, we also mentioned that the mechanisms behind their beneficial effects really haven't been investigated. Okay, so now I'm gonna go to the one on the right, on the top. Um, the Claire's group also published um, this review um, the relationship between mushroom intake and cognitive performance, which was, I'm sorry, it's not really a review. It was an epidemiological study in a certain population, um, European investigation of cancer, the Norfolk cohort. So this cohort has about 30,000 people. And so it's a population study. So they followed them over 18 years and they, they got data on them three times, um, over the 14 years that they looked at in this study because the 18 years isn't all um, available to look at. And so they measured cognition also at that 14 year time point. And by food frequency questionnaires, they looked at mushroom intake. And what they found was mushroom consumers displayed better cognitive performance than non-consumers across a multitude, across different mul multiple cognitive domains especially with those consuming one or more portions per week showing the highest cognitive scores. So this is just the sampling of some of that data. The HVLT on the right, of, I'm sorry, left of this figure is um, a word 
this learning test of cognition and you can see and those not consuming remembered less words than those consuming mushrooms it's very small <laughs> hopefully you guys can read it um one more than one week more than once a month one to three times per month or once a month and then the one on the right i can barely read it but i think it was um, a mood questionnaire so you had improved um, mood so again it showed that one plus servings per week showed the best performance if you looked at all the different cognitive tests that were given um, but one thing of concern and maybe we can even discuss this in um, the discussion is that over that 14 years actually four percent of the people stopped consuming mushrooms altogether they don't we don't have a reason why that is but i just thought that was um, something we could discuss so now I'm going to go down to our uh, study, um, the bottom left. And so we were charged uh, by the Mushroom Council. Um, well, we charged them, <laughs> but they said, well, what would happen um, if we did a randomized control study to investigate the acute effects of mushrooms on cognition, mood, and metabolic effects in older adults? And one of the goals of this study was to get an appropriate dose to then take into a, a chronic study. So we chose oyster mushrooms, which are again, rich in ergothionine. And we looked at their improvement over six hours. So these were older adults from 60 to 80 years old, and they came in four times. And randomly, they either got no mushrooms, um, a half a serving of mushrooms, one serving and this one serving is equivalent to 85 grams of fresh mushrooms that i think dr campbell talked about and then are two servings and that's the grams in dried weight underneath the portions um so we mix them into a breakfast that was more like a, a noodle soup um and we measured different um we started at bait, we had a bait, they came in for the day and one of these four times, each day was the same. Um, the, the only thing that differed is what they got um, to eat, the portion size. And they came in for, and they had a baseline measurement of cognitive and mood tests. Then they had their breakfast and then they were tested every two hours after the breakfast at two, four and six hours. And blood was drawn at, at the six hour time point. And what we showed um, basically, if you looked at all the results, only a sampling is here, is that one portion per day seemed to have some benefits. So that's what we then took to the long-term study. And you can see here, the first graph is um, a mood result. And you can see by six hours, if they just had the zero portion, their mood declined, but it didn't decline if they had any portions of mushrooms. And then the graphs at the bottom of that figure um, are some of the things that we measured in the blood. And so we measured their ability to protect against inflammation. So we actually have a cell model where we put the serum that we took from the people who had eaten the portions of the different mushrooms in a cell culture model where we increase the inflammation by putting on a substance that does that called LPS. And then we look to see is the serum protective against those increases in inflammation. And you can see particularly that one portion looks um, pretty good. The one in the medium green, I guess, lime green, um, looks pretty good against those markers of inflammation. So from there, um, we ran a randomized control trial to investigate the chronic effects of cognition, mood, and, and this anti-inflammatory metabolic effects of the oyster mushroom. And so we finished collecting the data, I think last month, and we're analyzing the results right now. But we picked that one portion of oyster mushrooms, again, equivalent to 85 grams of fresh. It was a 12 week intervention. Um, they either had, this was two different groups. They either had control for no mushroom for, for 12 weeks or that, um, one portion of oyster mushroom. 
and we did a battery again of cognitive and new tests. We also did um, EEG, which is a measure of electrical activity in the brain and took their blood. Um, I think I'll stop there. Um, we don't have results from this study yet, but um, we did similar uh, tests as we did in the acute study. Um, and in addition with the EEG. So I think I'll stop there. Oh, thank, thank you. Um, thanks to all of our researchers for this uh, very informative update because that will help uh, uh, set the stage for where we wanna go next. So as you can see, research does add to the scientific uh, uh, literature, but there are other benefits of uh, the Mushroom Council's Nutrition Research Program because it adds to the industry's reputation as a uh, consistent, incredible source of scientific information that is uh, gathered, um, that is under the direction of a research advisory panel. And so the council becomes viewed as a trusted source of nutrition science. And then experts at communicating then will be able to use those messages and amplify the science to consumers. And what's also important that these key messages are approved by USDA, which then again adds more credibility to the nutrition research uh, program. So the next three slides are just a very quick sampling of the types of media coverage that your science uh, basis provides for the media to take to the consumers. So here's just one about um, the benefits of mushrooms, uh, 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 along with recipes. The next one shows um, uh, a, a particular targeting to those who are interested in uh, vegetables and vegetarian diets. And then the uh, last one, I guess, uh, talks about putting mushrooms as a superfoods that dietitians say um, should be uh, part of everyone's uh, 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 healthy eating pattern. So, um, with that, I think it's time now to um, take a look at what all this means as we go forward. Leslie will lead us on how research will help support the communication to meet consumers where they are and help identify the potential big and unique areas of investigation going forward. So I hope by this background where you saw the results of the nutrition research from a successful nutrition research program, we are conducting analytical data on mushrooms. We are then conducting consumption studies, tying those nutrients to health benefits. And now we're going to take a look at how that can be uh, communicated and, um, and going forward to make sure that we continue to uh, position mushrooms uh, as a unique win. So Leslie, um, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Mary Jo. And thank you, everybody. Thank you to our researchers for the update. Absolutely fascinating. And as a registered dietitian and a nutrition communicator that is doing my darn best in the sea of sinfluencers out there to put out credible nutrition information, I'm so thankful to all of you for providing me the food for thought to convey this, and we need to continue to. So I want to go over this slide very briefly, which is from the latest uh, food and health survey conducted by the International Food Information Council. And looking at those areas of interest, what is it that's top of mind for consumers or top of tongue for consumers, so to speak? is what is it that consumers want from food? Uh, less fatigue and more energy. I think that's not consumers, that's all of us. <laughs> we all want that. Uh, the idea of healthy aging, we luckily are migrating away from the term anti-aging because that means death. So obviously that's not what we're looking for. Weight management is still an issue. And I think right now a bigger one because of the number of people that are on the GLP-1 and every diet out there known to man and womankind. Digestive and gut health is certainly something that many, many consumers are interested in. Cardiovascular health, and we've already heard Dr. Campbell talk about this and benefits of mushrooms in that regard. And brain health or cognitive health is certainly moving up in the priority list of more people thinking about it and not just those who are older or what I would say seasoned, but even for younger adults thinking about that as well. 
In addition to those trends, wellness is a big one. People are thinking more about wellness. It's fascinating. When I started in this field, wellness was top of mind in the 80s, and then it kind of went away. And, oh, it's back again. It never went away, but here we are. Uh, the idea of vegan, vegetarian, plant-based diet. And I think this really presents some very unique opportunities for mushrooms because people who are choosing to take things with faces off their plate? Uh, what are the alternatives that they're choosing and are they doing the best for their body with what it is that they're choosing to have? So that presence of mushroom as that decision on the plate can be a very, very powerful one from a health perspective. And the idea of more fiber that, yes, that is the F word for 2024 and hooray, we've kind of gotten away from the P word, which is protein uh, and bringing F into the into the dialogue as well. And so we have some, some good challenges that are here. So now it is time for our, our round table and I can see everybody's faces now. So this is really very nice. So I will be the, 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 the MC moderator at the moment and putting this question out to all of you that I believe you all had a chance to chew on um, before today and looking forward to some robust discussion. So let me just briefly say what that is question is, is as we look at the current consumer nutrition landscape, what stands out as the strongest opportunities for future mushroom research and promotion? And since I'm kind of looking here the way that I see things on my slide, Dr. Hale, I think we're going to start with you because I see you first next to me. Well, for me, it's all about cognition, <laughs> but that's my personal um, opinion. But Whenever I go to meetings and talk, people always are interested in aging healthily, like you're saying, um, but most important people want to be able to avoid um, that decline in cognition um, that we see so many of our parents or grandparents have. And I think that, I mean, our study only looked at oyster mushrooms. There's many, many, many other mushrooms that we could look at in, in this model. I mean, lion's mane is hot for that right now, but I don't think personally there's a lot of really good research on it. So that's, I think that's an opportunity. But I mean, most people also consume the white button mushrooms. So maybe that's another opportunity to look at that. Um, but I also think the, the, the research on what's in the mushrooms is going to become very important. And what is it? I mean, there's so many things as, as, they, um, as we found out from Dr. Campbell in the mushrooms, but I bet they all have different mechanisms of action. So I think that's a good um, space to look at too. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Campbell, I see you next, so take it away. You'll have to unmute for us. I'm getting there. Is that it? okay? Um, there's several things that I think uh, we should be mindful of when we design our new research experiments. Uh, and I don't want this to come across as a negative. I think it becomes as a, uh, ultimately as a positive, but there are challenges that we have to think about uh, in how we move this forward to show and demonstrate health promotion through mushrooms. One of them is that, uh, as several of us described, there's very little experimental research on cognition, on cardiovascular health, on gut health, on other types of health. The, the research is just starting to come out from studies in, in, with human participants. And that's great, but it, it one study in and of itself is not enough to really go out and take a, a, a strong message to the public. Uh, and so continuing to build on the studies that have been done and are ongoing and need to be done in the future to really build a, a credible uh, body of reproducible findings uh, to support the cardiometabolic or gut or, or brain health uh, properties of mushrooms uh, really is a necessity. A second one is how much mushrooms do people really need to eat to have a beneficial effect? Uh, my studies and uh, Barbara's study 
uh, you know, we, we were talking about one serving or, or maybe even two servings per day. Yet the observational studies that have, are out there are talking about one or two servings per month or maybe a serving per week. And so there's a real somewhat of a disconnect in how much mushrooms we, uh, we, we are scientifically assessing to be effective versus what the ep epidemiology or the observational research is uh, showing to be um, ha have positive influences. Uh, there needs to be more research in, on, in both types of studies, experimental and observational, uh, and getting scientists that specialize in each of those types of uh, uh, experiments to, uh, to be collaborating together, I think could really bring a, 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 a new th a thought process to how we can move forward with research on mushrooms for health. Um, the third part, the, the last thing I'll mention just briefly, is when I, we were doing these uh, uh, controlled feeding studies, uh, we were very mindful of how much mushrooms cost to pers uh, to the public, and uh, when we, you know, just from personally going to the grocery store and and how much mushrooms uh, I could receive for a given amount of money, you know, be it five dollars or ten dollars for containers of mushrooms, and then to think that, and that was for white button or crimini or portobello mushrooms. To then go to the uh, more uh, less frequently available or more specialized mushrooms, at least in the United States, like lion's mane, I think that we have to be careful about uh, what how we design our experiments so that we are studying the amounts and the forms, fresh versus powdered, for example versus fresh versus powdered versus isolated compounds from derived from mushrooms to uh, on these health outcomes. Uh, so that we, when we start to see positive effects of the mushrooms, it's in, uh, we are mindful of the, the, not only the availability, but the, the, the cost availability of them when advertising um, comes to, uh, down the road. So I'll stop there. Dr. Dwyer. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's a lot of mushroom research that's been done with a lot of good news. And I think their research needs to continue. And it's also necessary to continue to show how it translates into people's real eating lives. And Wayne brought up some good points on that because it's with all its warts. It's what, 10 minutes, maybe a half hour people spend preparing dinner, for example. So can't get too exotic. I think it's also important to take advantage of the connections with the um, USDA. I don't know what you can do with the, the checkoff programs, but um, exploring um, use of mushrooms in large federal programs, I think is some something that might be useful. But for me, the, the big win here <clears throat> in terms of going forward with the research is continue all of the, the metabolic studies that you've heard about and the composition studies, but continue also to remember that these mushrooms fit pretty well, the buttons, the, the ones that are most common, uh, as well as the exotic ones. But uh, they really fit very well into what I'm hearing at uh, on the uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans uh, Advisory Committee right now in terms of reducing diet-related chronic de degenerative disease, increasing sustainability, eating local, because if you're talking about fresh mushrooms, that works in there. So you've got the, the culinary flexibility of these products that they're plant-based and that's the way things are moving. Um, they're sustainable uh, and 
the life cycle assessment of these things is really more like veggies and fruits than it is like uh, uh, beef and pork. Um, the other thing, I was listening earlier today to a, a something FDA put out on growing mushrooms and food safety. And the safety, I think, is something else that needs to be, it, you've already researched it, certainly the white button people have. Um, I don't know about some of these supplements that are coming in. I wonder about them, particularly the uh, international ones. I think that's a big uh, can of worms. It's one left maybe to other groups like FDA. But so you've got sustainability, culinary flexibility, the nutrients, and then you've heard of these emerging uh, science bioactives that Barbara talked about. But the thing that I haven't heard too much about is that, that there are no negatives, that mushrooms don't have any negatives from the standpoint of a, uh, someone like me, a clinical nutritionist and dietitian. They're nutrient dense, they're low in calories. These are all words that the um, dietary guidelines people are talking about. It's excellent in selenium and copper, and it's a good source of uh, riboflavin and niacin. So you've got that plus ergo and glutathione and beta-glucans, et cetera. They're, they're all interesting, but it's emerging science and we need to know um, that as well. I think going forward, um, what we have to also remember and building around this research, I'm not saying don't do it. I think we have to continue to explore these things, the cognition particularly, is to think about food-related quality of life, that it's better with mushrooms and they're healthy. And the other thing to think about is the kind of research that you need to do with the millennials. And it turns out I'm in what's called the great, greatest, no, I'm, I think I'm a, I can't remember what my generation is, but it's an older one. But I, I do know how to cook. And I can tell you, because I used to work at Procter & Gamble, and this was a long time ago, people do not know how to cook. So there, it's a different kettle of fish if you're talking about people about 55 or so versus everybody younger. And that's where you're having the problem with some of these, these millennials who don't give their kids any mushrooms. So that research is needed. Um, it's consumer research, but it's another kind of research that's necessary. So I think you've got a lot of opportunities, not only with Generation Z and millennials who need help learning to cook and do very simple recipes and jazz up routine meals, but also with the boomers and the Generation X and even the greatest generation like me, focusing research on use of mushrooms and plant-based, those people don't want to talk, think about vegan or vegetarian, but plant-based is different. And so fitting those things all together with this research that's so interesting that you've already heard about is where I think you should be going. Thank you. Dr. Clemens, to you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Leslie. It's been a long time since we connected. See, where was that last, Leslie? <laughs> I don't know, some foreign country somewhere well, at a bar? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I trust you're doing well in Philadelphia. You're still in Philadelphia? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 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 Yeah. You were in the Stevens, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, not, I, and recently with the Chiefs, and now, thank God, my NFL <laughs> career is done. So I'm finished. Like, done. Okay, I get it. Uh, I really enjoyed today's presentations. Um, they're very enlightening and kudos to the Mushroom Council for sponsoring these things. Uh, and the clinical work, I'm passionate about that, Wayne. Thank you so much for sharing it's so succinctly uh, the work that you've done and for Robert, the, the issues of cognitive function and the details of chemistry. Um, I won't add, I can't add really anything to what Johanna has said, but I, on my base, um, one, I like the fact we're looking at the whole food and not the ingredients or components, as pointed out earlier. And I think, Wayne, you mentioned that it contains uh, probably tens of thousands of components that people are not aware of. I do the same thing in my toxicology class and people are stunned. I use breast milk as an example, but you get the idea, Wayne, of course. And part of that 
it would be interesting as we look at polymorphisms, and I'm glad you're doing some metabolism. As we look at polymorphisms and, and metabolizing or synthesizing some of these compounds, you know, like glutathione, uh, the run are intermediaries, as you well know, and many times people can't do it, particularly as we get older. Uh, there are genetic profiles that change as genetic activities change. And so we look at popular, not only for glutathione, but as I've done some work in cognitive function in the state of Florida, that's right, it still is a state. Um, and we know that many positive polymorphisms affect metabolism, even in neural functions. And so at the end of the day, somehow, as we move along, as indicated by Mary Jo, if we draw more detailed information for the future, we can't do it right away, but I think it's going to be very important. I did one study, uh, one large study but with cognitive uh, function of very senior people. And uh, Wayne, um, it was clearly, we showed um, APOE4E, as you know, APOE4, excuse me, and they didn't want to measure, but I had data with my colleagues that showed that it really makes a difference in how people respond to these various interventions. And we seldom see that kind of information. I, I think it, it's just to close, I'm really interested in not, even though I teach toxicology, but I'm really interested in looking at these the complexities of the whole food. And I'm glad you're doing the whole food and not the single food. I'm glad we was mentioned today about fresh food versus dried, freeze dried. And we could talk about that. Um, but I think we really need to understand what the C-maxes are, the T-halves T, T are, and also for these kinds of compounds or complexities of compounds in how these in compounds, particularly as we get older, as, as, we, as Joanna used it, what, what, we're seasoned. Is that how it works there, Joanna? Uh, in, this, in, these, in this particular season. Adders. <laughs> there we go. I like what you're saying. Uh, matter of fact, how does it interact with pharmaceutical agents? Um, mm -hmm. That's the space of where I work, uh, and and the nutrition support needed to maintain quality of life uh, to whatever the end period might be. Um, so my mind also says it kind of builds on what you're doing, Wayne. There, and and also what what Barbara was sharing with us today is that what do we do in terms of this as we get a little bit older, in terms of dose, frequency of dose, and duration of dose of, of a food. And I like mushrooms, by the way, and I eat mushrooms probably two or three times a week because I eat it with almost anything and everything. So I really like them, uh, but we don't have those kinds of data. And, and to the safety side, and you, you have identified several mushroom species in this conversation, but the general public doesn't realize there are 10 to 100,000, maybe even over a million species of mushrooms, and they're not safe. And if I, we, if I recall correctly, Mary Jo, when we had a meeting in Washington, D.C., I think we decided there, when John was chair, I think there were about 20, 25 mushroom species that were safe for human consumption. The others are not. Uh, and people don't realize it. I think generally people think that all mushrooms are safe, but they're not. And uh, so I do, we have to point out to the safety of these issues. And when it comes to safety, what do we set for safety? I, I charge this many of my classes here at USC and Michigan State, what is safety now may not be safety for tomorrow. And I would like to think maybe some type of safety includes some type of cognitive function or maybe GI issues and pick your favorite organ system. But I think, and immunological, immunology is so complex. It's not a single entity, but it's a very complex system and not everyone responds the same. So I think through the kinds of studies that the, the really great presenters did today and have done and will continue to do, we trust, will actually elucidate some of those mechanisms and how what mushroom play in the area called immune function. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Titian, I'm not sure I pronounced your name correctly. I apologize if I did not. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's Ditchin. It rhymes with kitchen. So that's easy for us in uh, the Mushroom Council uh, arena to remember. So. Um, my background, for those who don't know, is sensory and consumer behavior. So I have a little bit different um, perspective here. And I guess one of the things that really strikes me is that we can make these connections between health and, um, you know, good health outcomes and um, mushroom consumption, but still that consumer needs to make the decision to purchase and eat mushrooms. So um, some of those things that we might want to, um, you know, consider in our, you know, realm of 
of um, ensuring that consumers do make those decisions is that, I mean, we have a lot of things going for us. Their mushrooms are very versatile. Um, they absorb a lot of flavor. They have a lot of flavor on their own. Um, umami is a term that is now, it's, well, it's not new to me uh, from, you know, the 20, 25 years I've been working in taste research. Um, but people use it every day now to talk about things. So um, these are sort of maybe more trendy kind of ideas that we can use to sort of jump on. Um, and we've, you know, heard the everything about um, versatility of mushrooms and so on and so forth. Um, but some of the things that drive consumer interest in, in products or drive liking are, well, there's two, there's taste and texture, mainly like big categories. So um, one thing I think is maybe to an advantage is um, there's such a huge variety of mushrooms that they don't all taste the same. They don't have the same texture. Um, they might not have the same shelf life. They might not have the same um, type of odors and, you know, smells while they're cooking and so on. So is there a way that we can jump onto that to take advantage and show our consumers out there that we do have quite a bit of variety? Um, I'm not going to mention anything more about plant-based uh, diets. I think that's um, certainly out there. I will talk about um, the generations too um, that echoed with me um, uh, earlier when we heard from Joanna. But um, you know, the younger generations obviously are much more into social media and influencers and things like that. And maybe for some of us, that's not really um, that much of a um, something that we experience day to day, or maybe we roll our eyes about it, but these are, are this is real, this is tangible for these people. So, um, you know, is there a way that we can boost interest and willingness to try mushrooms through quick cooking videos and things like that to appeal to people to reduce the hurdle for preparation, make it easy, um, show them something that they've not seen before, um, I mean, appeal to sort of global cuisine interest and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of different, uh, you know, sort of opportunities and challenges and so on. Um, I will mention just echoing sort of what Dr. Campbell talked about in terms of price, you know, certainly the cost of living is a huge pressure now for this younger generation, um, much different than it was for um, people earlier. So let's make sure we consider things that are approachable in, within reach, available and so on. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention, um, talking maybe a bit more about uh, Dr. Hale's uh, research or comments on, on cognition and so on, there's this area called implicit testing, which is essentially trying to um, measure uh, if, if it's mood and so on and so forth by some outward, um, I guess, uh, evaluation. So for example, can we relate the um, heart rate to happiness? Um, can we relate, you know, where our eyes are looking on an ad for our interest and so on and those types of things? Um, you know, the temperature of our skin for, you know, um, contentedness and, and things like that. So there is a challenge between trying to connect these, you know, important compounds that are in things like mushrooms to that final outcome of, yes, that makes me happier or it boosts my mood. And there are many steps along the way. And so the idea of even trying to understand whether one of these implicit measures can actually truly be predictive of mood, um, a cog maybe cognition is a separate area of study, but, but the point being that um, it's not necessarily that the person researching the mushrooms is going to have all of that expertise along the way. So it might be really important for us to connect those scientists with each other to see sort of an end-to-end -end progression in terms of our science. Um, and it, we often in sensory science talk about ad claims. Well, it's really hard for us to say eating product X is going to cause you know, this increase in happiness. We can say eating product X gives you an increase in this compound that you're tasting. And then separately, there's another study showing that increasing this compound in your diet will, you know, increase your heart health or something like that. So um, there's sort of this connection that has to be made. Um, and it's not easy. These are not easy things to measure, especially since we have so many different influences in our diet, um, different things that we eat, different you know, the, the time of day that we do our testing can also influence how happy we feel or, um, you know, different kinds of um, 
uh, measurements in the body and so on. So just wanted to address that as being something that is like this implicit testing is is new and interesting, um, but there's not necessarily a lot of really confirmational science behind it right now. So we need to uh, make sure we address that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Watt? Hi, and thank you for all the good comments so far, and particularly uh, the scientific presentations. I think a lot of good information there presented uh, with great clarity, and that's certainly appreciated. So I take a sort of practical approach to all this, um, having worked very intimately with the mushroom industry for 40 plus years. Um, and to me, the, the objective of what the council is trying to accomplish um, with the scientific research that it sponsors is to drive consumption, right? We want people to eat more mushrooms. Um, and to me, that means that we need to identify what the unique proposition is about mushrooms. Um, it's gotta be something you're not gonna get somewhere else, right? I mean, we've talked, for example, about um, a vitamin D enhanced mushroom by treating it with ultraviolet light. But look, you can get vitamin D in milk, you can get it now in orange juice, you can get it in you know, lots of other places. You're not gonna go out and buy the mushrooms just to enhance your vitamin D intake. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about our research in terms of the practical result that's gonna drive people to the store because they want to get a mushroom for a specific purpose. Um, and to that end, I think some of the work that's been done, for example, with ergothionine, you're only gonna get ergothionine from a fungal system other than what you're gonna pick up as um, you know, carry-alongs on the fruits and vegetables that maybe haven't been washed quite as well as they should have been. Right, we have um, a transporter system in the body uh, for ergo. Right, we need to understand what that means, um, and and ask ourselves whether we can parlay that into a story that is going to encourage people to go buy mushrooms. Now, you know, recognizing from the council standpoint that a large portion of the funding obviously comes from agaricus growers because they are the, you know, it is the most widely produced and consumed mushroom, certainly in North America. But it doesn't mean that um, promoting other less popular mushrooms, and I, I actually hate to call them exotics, and maybe would prefer something like non-agaricus mushrooms, um, can drive people to the same conclusion if, in fact, they can get some ergo from the mushrooms they're putting on their pizza on Friday night. Um, but the story is mushrooms are the only place you're going to get ergo. Now, I think, you know, both Drs. Campbell and Clemens have mentioned very importantly that we need to understand what what is an acceptable level, right? I mean, is it 83 grams? You know, what what how much do you need to take and how often to have that realistic effect for something like ergo? Um, you know, but there are other things, um, you know, there's the whole story of beta glucans, right? And we talk about beta glucans and their effect on, on immune support. We know nothing. I mean, we don't know, we don't know what beta glucans are good, how often they should be branched, how large they should be to have an effect. And every mushroom is producing a different array of, um, you know, one, three, one, six, all sorts of different materials. We don't know, but it's a unique proposition that mushrooms can provide a consumer that, you know, if the research backs it up, can drive the consumer to go to the store and say, you know what, I need to eat more mushrooms. I'm gonna pick some up to put on the steak or the salad or in a sauce or whatever. Um, you know, I think glutathione, ergo, they're sort of in the same boat there. Um, you know, we talked briefly, uh, Tanya talked about, uh, you know, umami. You know, there's there's a fair amount of glutamic acid in mushrooms. Um, you know, it's a unique amino acid in terms of its ability to impart umami. Okay, I don't know if it's important or not, but I think it's worthwhile looking at. And the whole cognitive thing, I mean, it's an opening area, an area opening up for research 
Um, I think, you know, most of us on the, on the science side have started looking up papers that involve tau protein 217. Um, we have a blood test now that talks to cognitive decline um, in adults. Um, you know, if we want to talk about what mushrooms can do relative to cognitive decline, we have an ability now with a blood test to actually make a measure, come up with the result and determine whether in fact mushrooms may or may not have um, an influence on something like the tau proteins, um, which, you know, everybody's talking about tau bodies and Alzheimer's disease. You know, if we could find something like that, I think it's it's meaningful and it's something that the consumer can relate to, right? And then you say, look, mushrooms are ahead of the curve here. We've been looking at, at cognitive decline and we're measuring this particular blood marker and here are our results. And this is why you should go buy some of the mushrooms. Um, <coughs> I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I, there's there's a lot of things percolating in my brain, but I'm, I'm Dr. Phillips. Um, yes. So the, my, my background is in food composition analysis, and I think I just want to reiterate that the main findings from our work is this huge variability among, like within a mushroom type let alone, you know, we have certain groups of mushrooms that may overall be lower in certain components. Um, I do believe in looking at the whole product, like Dr. Campbell's research showed, there's many other things in the mushroom. But I think these compounds indicate that, I'm, I, this could explain a lot of the variability among studies, for example. Um, I don't know when the mushrooms are procured for a given controlled trial, if it's one one batch, one product, but not all, you know, mushrooms that you go out and purchase, even if it's just an oyster mushroom, are the same, especially with dried products. Um, we've done some other research. Vitamin D, for example, is hugely variable among different products of dried mushrooms. So, I just think making health claims is being confounded by the fact that mushrooms vary a lot and that we need to pin down better what exactly is being said to people or being studied. Because it goes beyond just a compound. It goes, it's down to like this particular sample, you know, or procurement of a mushroom. And I assume that within growing, there's lots of different, you know, which flush you harvest or maybe the media it's grown on could affect cause these differences. We haven't really looked into that. That wasn't the point of our study. So that would be my biggest thing to say about this. And it also, I guess as far as marketing, you know, if you could determine what processing or conditions lead to the most benefits then, then you could promote a certain type of mushroom. But I just don't think you could make a general claim and people eat more mushrooms and say it's the same whether you eat a white button or, you know, an oyster. So I guess that's all I have to really say about it. I'm just going to throw a, a question out there. It's something that I mentioned in my intro. And, uh, since the, the interest uh, in use of the GLP-1 is not going away in any way, shape, or form, and will continue to increase with compounds, et cetera, uh, the beta-glucan and impact of beta-glucan on GLP-1. And just looking at, we talk about oat in that regard, just looking at things potentially and not to make a story out of it because it's obviously too early, but if something that could potentially be of interest to people saying, oh, I never thought about a mushroom in that regard and benefit of mushroom as it might impact my appetite and my weight, which is not to eat a mushroom and then you're not hungry for an eclair, obviously, no. But just looking at some other potential things that could be of interest as we have this conversation to your point, Dr. Walk, about the, the uniqueness of mushrooms. Uh, you're probably not going to find uh, beta-glucan in 
everything that's out there. We know we don't find it in everything that's out there. So, and the benefit of mushroom being a low calorie item, the benefit of the umami in mushroom, which makes it a lot more flavorful choice for people that are opting to issue animal protein and looking for some way to put some chew and some deliciousness into the things that they eat. So I'm throwing that out there as number one and number two, um, perhaps as a, as a guide for consumers, a flavor wheel. What mushroom to use for what? Because again, I think people, oh, well, that, that, that looks scary or what is this? Or I don't know how it's going to taste, but if I'm looking to use it in this particular application in a recipe, given the fact that they're not inexpensive, how do I use it? How long does it take to cook? And that's something that I don't think anybody brought up. They cook quickly. And you know, for people that are time pressed and don't want to be spending hours and hours in the kitchen, that is another advantage of mushrooms. So, all right, I'll be quiet and, and let somebody else handle the Q&A part. Amy, I'm turning it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Um, and thank you to all of our experts. This was so informative. I've got pages of notes that are going to definitely be inspiring both the direction of our nutrition research program and the um, elements of our nutrition promotion program. Because as, sev as, as several of you have pointed out, you know, we have to figure out how to connect those as, as tightly as possible. Um, we have to really make sure that what we already have in our body of evidence around mushroom nutrition is being fully used in our communications to consumers. Um, and then we have to make sure that the research that we invest in going forward is research that can be applicable to our communications program and to consumers' everyday lives, ultimately to drive consumption. Um, Christy, I know you've been receiving some questions from our participants, and I'll ask you to bring those up if there are any that are worth um, kind of bringing to the full gr to group. Right now, we have about 10 more minutes that we can get some of these questions answered live. Yeah, we have some fascinating questions coming up here. I would love to um, have the team um, answer them to the group and have a little bit of a discussion about them. But um, we are, um, I want to remind everyone too, to use the Q&A feature to um, type in your questions to the group and we can share. But we had a question that came in a little bit earlier about ergothionine and um, uh, have it having been called the longevity vitamin. And does the, the group here agree that that would be uh, a, a, a good title for that vitamin. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll come out and say, um, I don't think the evidence is there for that yet. Uh, I know Barry Hollowell over in, um, <clears throat> in Singapore. I, I don't know if he's doing this study. He was talking about it last time I was in Singapore. <clears throat> um, doing a study uh, to look at that. Now, of course, in Singapore, they're using a lot more of what the what you would call exotics, so they're very high in ergo compared to a white butt. Um, but I think it'd be interest. I think those studies need to be done. I know the Mushroom Council's done some, um, but basically, as far as I'm concerned, it's still emerging science. I would agree with Johanna. Yeah, I, I agree also. Um, and just to add a little bit maybe to it, uh, someone commented about a health claim. Uh, I, we have to be careful about how we might throw that term around um, and uh, perhaps more shy away from that, the, the, the claim part and go to maybe a structure function claims that because of, of what compounds and, and things, you know, just from a, because if, if you're going to make a, a formal claim, then you have to go through a lot of hoops to get that uh, authorized. The other thing though, that I'm, I'm, I've really appreciated in our discussion and, and presentation so far is, uh, you know, from a consumer perspective, they get bombarded with, um, Food, you know, nutrition advice based on nutrients, based on foods, and based on dietary patterns. And without really mentioning, it, we are uh, swaying back and forth amongst those three levels of specificity to sort of broadness. 
in how people, how we are conveying our message, uh, our information and our research. And I think that, there, that this is really a challenge, but it's also a really great opportunity for the Mushroom Council because you don't, you're not picking out one message to broadcast everywhere. There will be times when you want to do, you know, com a nutrient or compound messaging and other times you want it to be food. But one of the things that is interesting to me is that when you look at the epidemiology of where they have put um, mushrooms as a, uh, uh, you know, in, in more, more mushroom intake is promoting various aspects of health. Uh, and I think it was mentioned uh, earlier that that may or may not be specific to mushrooms, but the overall dietary pattern of those people and that they're, when they're eating healthier, they're more likely to also be including mushrooms. And so uh, when you talked about messaging, uh, you know, the dietary guidelines, thankfully mushrooms are in there, but they're in there in the other vegetable category. Uh, you can fight the fight to become your own food, so, uh, food group, but it, we can also say, you know, these recipes in these, you know, that are mushroom and then plant-based, uh, that's going to also help people eat more healthy overall. Uh, and use mushrooms as a, uh, a you know, a, a catch to help people eat overall healthier diets. Thank you. Um, we did receive a few questions from folks that were lamenting that they couldn't join us live, but are looking forward to um, listening to the recording. So I'll share a, a couple of those questions. Are there any opportunities in uh, sports nutrition uh, for mushrooms? Oh, I think it's a better choice than collagen. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm working working with athletes all of the time, and and yes, I did get the chief to eat the mushrooms. It was a struggle, but they did try. Uh, but I do think that uh, we're looking at it, 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 it's it, it's different because it's not this is definitely going to increase your performance. There haven't been studies that have looked at that. But uh, when you're looking at health benefits in a way that's easy, in a way that's flavorful, in a way that also can be incorporated into a food that is familiar to that athlete, because that is critically important. If it looks strange to them, chances are they're not going to try it. So it's easy for me. The blend the blend has been perfect in that regard because you're going to eat a burger. So we've made that burger. Uh, we don't have to tell you why we made it better. Oh, this tastes delicious. Bingo, there's a win. So those are, those are the types of things to continue to put that message out there. And it also uh, is a way of getting it. I think mushroom becomes the gateway. I'm using that in a positive term here to putting other vegetables into the mix of what it is that people are consuming. So by virtue of that produce to perform, they're getting better because they're eating more vegetables in spite of themselves by adding more mushroom into the mix. Great. Yeah, the elderly, uh, older uh, is certainly not sports <laughs> related, but you, it seems to me there's an opportunity to do that that blend in the uh, older Americans Act uh, congregate meals. Yes, definitely. Great. Another question we received, and I, I, this might be our last one because we're running out of time here, but um, the question was, it seems like mushroom nutrition research could eventually benefit non-fresh mushrooms, um, such as mushroom powders and supplements. How can we be sure that we're um, avoiding investing in research that ultimately doesn't help move fresh mushrooms, which is really the Mushroom Council's charge? Yeah. Well, I would hope that the, the research that I'm doing is actually will ultimately help move fresh mushrooms. We purposely are using fresh mushrooms. Uh, I, and I think that the more that we learn of not only compositionally, but uh, also from uh, how people f uh, perceive their health, as well as how we actually objectively document their health or, or other aspects of their life are uh, going to help drive that. And so 
uh, I just I just want to reiterate that we you know we're purposefully doing these studies in fresh with fresh mushrooms with, uh, because of the mandate of the mushroom council. I think you always have to think of mushrooms in the context of meals. And um, I have doubts myself about the uh, safety of some of these products that are coming in from other countries in terms of uh, the supplements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all that is true. But at the end of the day, if we're looking at compounds with maybe the exception of volatiles, um, you know, mushroom powders, by virtue of the fact that, you know, assuming that they're made to a, a reasonable standard, are going to have the same ingredients that um, the whole mushroom has, minus the water, as I said, and minus whatever volatiles you have. So in answer to, to the question from that individual, um, I think it becomes a marketing exercise to say, you know, you want the freshest, you want the best, you want the locally grown, you're going to get all the benefits. Um, but, you know, from a strictly from a scientific standpoint, um, you know, beta glucans or ergothionine or whatever we end up talking about, you know, if, if the dried ground powdered material, uh, whatever, however its form is, is, you know, made properly, uh, it's going to have those things in it. Um, and that that's just the way it is. Where where does the powder come from? Well, you know, you can have U.S. producers that are taking their, you know, cannery grade mushrooms and they can either, yeah. you know, put them in a can for stems and pieces um, or they can dry them and grind them or slice them or do whatever they want with them. It's not necessarily that that these powders are all coming from abroad. Um, you know, and they can be made to to the highest food grade standards for sure. Um, so but, you know, yeah. to, to say that we can do research and it will only benefit fresh mushrooms to the exclusion of, you know, dried or powdered or processed or canned or whatever, I don't think that's a reasonable approach to take unless we're going to be focusing on, as I say, things that would disappear like a volatile. Mushrooms are 93% water. I mean, it is what it is. Like any other I'm going to disagree with that. I'm going to disagree with um, the equivalence of the dried and fresh mushrooms based on our research. That that cannot, it is not the same necessarily when it is dried. And there's many different methods of drying conditions, especially vitamin D can be influenced dramatically. Um, during the processing and packaging of the mushrooms. So I think a lot more research would be needed to translate. But I do agree that dried mushrooms, I can't understand why they'd be excluded because most people, I mean, I do know a lot of people that buy dried mushrooms because they last longer, um, you know, they're easier to use. So, but I think that's one area where there would really, you know, if you took the data in, for example, the database and just added back the water, that would not accurately represent, as a rule, composition of the dried mushrooms. Roger, you have your hand up. <laughs> Put your mic on, Roger. I'm not, I am unusually patient. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Christy. Um, Wayne, you really raised a really important, many important questions and opportunities, and I appreciate your presentation because I'm, I'm the clinical side guy. Um, I thought your comments on total compounds was particularly intriguing. Um, is it, are we in a position, Wayne, to compare this with a NIST database or, or like TOX21 program to see what's out there and, and compare to these compounds and structures relative to do we, what little we know about metabolism? Uh, probably not yet uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that since many of these are not identified or annotated, 
we don't we just know that there that we don't know what compound that would actually be it, it could come off a, it could loot or you know be identified at a certain time or a certain peak but we can't actually with uh, uh, you know great confidence say that it is actually this particular compound uh so that that's one thing uh the second thing is is that our um you know the these experiments or, or these analytics are not cheap no. and, uh so we're doing untargeted not yeah. targeted so we don't have we really have we have a presence and an absence and a relative presence but we don't have an actual uh, concentrations unless you go to the targeted things like we're done for the ergo or for other you know individual compounds so to to try to think that we're going to all of a sudden go to ten thousand, you know, a couple of thousand <laughs> compounds on targeted analyses is, is not probably realistic. But on the other hand, you know, we we're talking. We you know, I, I emphasize the uniqueness of each mushroom, uh, a variety that we measured for, you know, uh, unique to to variety compounds. But the majority of the compounds were. Uh, you uh, were present in all varieties. I see that, mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I don't want to. I, I would hate to leave people thinking that we uh, we have to be studying each one mushroom. You know, the the next uh, a next phase or or thing would be to see if you're um, feeding people these uh, different mushrooms uh, to then look in people's blood blood and see what common compounds or metabolites they're actually digesting and absorbing. And then that will give you a, a next level of confidence that those compounds are first from the mushrooms and second are actually getting into the per person's uh, body to be potentially used for metabolism. And kind of your point there, and I'll, I'll transfer to the next person, Wayne, so many people talk about the microbiome. When I was at Hopkins, we did that work in pediatrics. Uh, so what is happening in the GI tract with all these compounds? Maybe they're rapidly metabolized. We just don't know that. And do they produce any compounds that we should be aware of? I'm not being alarmist. That's yeah. not what I do, but I just want to understand. Yeah, and no, I agree. Well, we another... don't agree yet. I wish oh. I knew the answer. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, but that's another way in which our serum studies are kind of I don't want to say unique, but I'll say unique um, in that we take the serum from the people who ate the mushrooms. So presumably all those compounds have been metabolized already. Yeah. Use that as a pretreatment in our studies. So rather than just putting, I mean, you can just put the mushroom on the cells and do that as well. But this seems to be a more authentic model, I guess, of what's going on in the body. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're starting to do complementary work to, to what you just described by uh, we've done a, uh, a pilot study with where we're feeding uh, people uh, either one uh, zero mushrooms, one serving of mushrooms, or two servings of mushrooms. Uh, that we're purposely picking the the white button and the uh, cremini uh, mm -hmm. oyster mushroom because of uh, the, the frequency of consumption in the U.S. Uh, and we are. Uh, that was one of the studies that you know we, I still have ongoing to see if we can actually, at least on an untargeted basis, see, get a sense of titration from zero to one to two servings about uh, relative amounts. Uh, we're focused right now on the actual compounds that will match up with what was the compounds in the mushroom. We have it. It would be a, a next generation experiment or additional. Uh, uh, analyses to go and uh, do metabolites. Thank you, Wayne, very much. That's very helpful. Great, great discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Mary Jo, did you have some closing thoughts um, for our panelists and attendees? Well, obviously, a, a huge thank you. Um, we will be following up uh, with you. Um, we're going to, as, as Christy said, the um, webinar has been recorded and it will eventually be posted on the Mushroom Council's website. But um, 
I think that, and, and we have tons of notes, if you have seen both Amy and Leslie and my write, writing down. So um, we will follow up as much as we can individually and um, and just keep all your your uh, advice in, in, in our thoughts as we plan for the next phase of uh, mushroom nutrition research. And uh, I will thank you all. And I think there's one slide maybe that has, well, I think most of you have my contact information, but um, if there's anything that you want to send to me after the webinar, um, there you have my email and my phone number. So uh, feel free to give me uh, a call, a chat, or, um, or send me an email and we'll follow up as much as we can. And I can't thank you enough. I think this has been very, um, very informative. I hope that our researchers um, you know, realize that I, I ask for updates periodically and I will continue to do that. And I, I feel like I uh, need to thank them again for their patience and my continual asking, you know, where's the data? Where are you? Well, when, when's it gonna be done? When's it gonna be published? And when can we use it? So um, thank you all for your uh, total commitment to mushroom nutrition research.